You're listening to Profiled, a podcast by NCCM, the National Council of Canadian Muslims, where we profile leaders of our community who inspire us every single day. My name is Omar Kamisa, and each week we'll be sitting with these amazing individuals to talk about their lives, the lessons they've learned, and their experiences being profiled. Assalamu alaikum. Welcome back. Hello and welcome back to episode number three of the Profiled Podcast. I'm your host, Community Engagement Officer here at NCCM, Omar Kamisa. Thank you so much for joining us again today. And as you can see, if you're watching it on YouTube, you can see we have a really special one in for today. So as always, I'm joined by my co-host, the man with the, that always has the plan, the CEO of NCCM, Mustafa Farouk. How are you doing, my brother? Doing great. How about you? Alhamdulillah, man. It's Ramadan, you know? There's never a bad day in Ramadan for me, you know? <laughs> <laughs> well, this is a special day indeed for us. Alhamdulillah, alhamdulillah. And we do have an extra, extra special guest today. Uh, a man, honestly, he needs no introduction. Uh, he's, to be honest, when I found out he was going to be doing this podcast with us, it was, I was kind of getting a little bit, you know, nervous, a little. Uh, it's like a man that's an inspiration and a hero to me. Uh, the CEO of uh, Paramount Fine Foods and chairman of the Fucky Foundation, uh, Dr. Fucky, How are you doing, sir? I'm very good. Thank you very much for having me. Alhamdulillah. Thank you so much for joining us. It's good to know that you're nervous so we can actually pick on you now. <laughs> <laughs> no, see, I was Fucky, the problem is, I, I've appeared in front of numerous judges before uh, and masters in court, but I'm sweating a little bit too. I don't know if the light is capturing it. <laughs> but I'm getting a little nervous too. <laughs> well, I, maybe I should have started asking questions myself instead then. <laughs> oh, then <laughs> you just put us on the spotlight then. That's fine then. <laughs> Dr. Well, Fucky, how, is fasting, how is fasting treating you, Dr. Fucky? You look like, mashallah, like you're uh, like, you know, we're like trying to figure out how to get a haircut, but you look like you're pretty good to go. Well, that's different. I learned how to get my own, to cut my own hair around three weeks ago. Because I figured out, I start seeing all my friends looking different than I'm used to see them. So I thought I had to find a solution. So I, I figured, until now, my children didn't trust me to cut their hair, but I'm cutting my own so far. <laughs> <laughs> Omar, how are you dealing with it? Oh, man. I, for me, like as an extrovert, it's it, being home by myself, like with just me and my wife, it's the weirdest thing in the world. Right? Like I just like being, like at both you guys, I like being in the community talking to people, seeing more people, like just being with everybody, right? And especially with Ramadan, like I'm sure you guys have the same, being with family, like uh, you want to go for iftar with everybody and you want to go for the salat, to, sal- to the masjid. Yeah, Allah, so much different, you know? Absolutely. But alhamdulillah, at least we're in a great country. And, uh, you know, I think we're being tested one more time. And that's the best thing. The Azure will be much bigger when, you're getting, get, when you get tested and, it's an opportunity to show leadership, an opportunity to lead by, by example. And I hope we all will pass that test and we'll, inshallah, celebrate Ramadan and, and we, we enjoy every single day. Inshallah. How do you that find it? Yeah, you know, in the Quran, it says that, you know, that ayah, you know, God will test you with everything that's so precious to you. Um, and I think this is one of those times that's a test. And, you know, وَبَشِّرَ الصَّابِرِينَ And, Indeed, those who are patient are those who are, uh, you know, successful, I suppose is probably a, a decent translation. Um, Guys, Dr. you just haven't, yeah, you haven't gone through a real growing pain, all of you. Like, I've been in a civil war. I've had <laughs> yeah, we're going to get into that. We're going to get into that. Yeah, we're going to get okay. into that. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, so, so. <laughs> there you go. It's a you perfect know, segue. Millennial problems. Millennial problems. <laughs> okay. So, Dr. Fricky, uh, this podcast is called Profile. And our goal with these podcasts is to really speak to heroes in our community, uh, heroes that inspire us, uh, and really, as is the name, is to profile them. Um, So saying that, I mean, obviously, many people in, uh, not just in the Canadian Muslim community, but in Canada, uh, I mean, you know, Dr. Fricky, you're probably one of the most well-known Canadian CEOs. Uh, You know, even when you go to the airport now, you'll see a location for Paramount Fine Foods uh, you know, you're a staple on newscasts. Uh, you know, it's hard to see a picture of the prime minister without you being sort of there as well. Uh, but, you know, that's all sort of, you know, what, what we're, where we are now. Uh, let's talk about, like, Dr. Fakir. Who is Mohamed Fakir? 
Uh, so, I mean, you, you alluded to, you know, the Civil War. And, I mean, you grew up in Beirut, Lebanon during the Civil War. That must have been just like a, just a different time for you and your family. Can you tell me a little bit about what it was like growing up during that environment? Well, I, as you said, I grew up in Lebanon. And thank you for the introduction. I'm not as important as you described me. I think I'm underselling uh, you. <laughs> thank you. But I grew up in Lebanon. Uh, my family did well. Uh, my dad did uh, build homes and towers. And they did very well. Uh, but yet, at the same time, we couldn't plan something for a year ahead, two years ahead, because there was always civil war, militias. Uh, there was occupations in some of the years. And we did spend a lot of nights in bunkers. And going back to that conversation that having Ramadan during coronavirus, that's paradise. Having Ramadan in a bunker with limited amount of food and sometimes no electricity and no heat or no air conditioning and the bad smell and, and, you know, was difficult. But to everyone out there that feel that they're struggling, the light always came and the light will come again. So we always were looking forward. I'll never forget my dad's face coming out of the bunker, like coming out of the best hotel in the world and smiling victoriously and say, we're going to build our country again. I can't wait to start doing business. I can't wait to hire more people. And to everyone here, we're not coming out of a bunker. So say alhamdulillah always and be grateful. We're not eating and fasting Ramadan without the television and without communication to others. We're maybe distanced in, in physically, but we're together in spirit and we are so connected. And maybe, maybe that gave us an opportunity to drop the phones a little bit and talk to our children and eat with them and spend more time with them. So we're blessed comparing to the lives a lot of us had uh, to go through even during Ramadan, outside Ramadan. So Alhamdulillah, the light will come and will open the doors of our houses and we'll walk out victor like feeling victorious because we, we did not lose a lot of us. And hopefully we'll realize that we're only as good and as healthy as the least looked after in our community. Because we just realized that if one of us is sick, we could all be sick. If one of, if one of us is exposed, we're all exposed. So yeah, uh, I grew up in a house where there was a little sadaqa box at the door of the house. And was the shots my mom wrote on it, handwritten, I'll never forget it, and it's still there. And it says sadaqa. My mom used to give us $5 and she used to give us the last loony uh, in 20 cents, uh, in 25 cents in Lebanon. And uh, she used to make us put a 25 cent in that sadaqa box. And she wired us that way. She wired us that if you want to be protected, if you want to be blessed, and if you want to do well at school, you need to start your day by doing something good to someone else. So we were wired that way with that sadaqa box. Right? And I know it will not make sense to KPMG and Deloitte guys and ladies that, and the formulas of Excel and business planning that more you pay, more you give, more you make. But let me tell you, in my world, more I gave, more I made. Right? So I understand what's on books, but in reality of business, from someone that came from nothing in Canada and lived in a basement apartment, more I gave, more I made. So I lived that life. I lived that life of having to leave my parents, my family, and leave to study something and that no one had heard of in Lebanon. And when I used to tell my dad I'm going to study gemologist, he used to look at me and say, what's wrong with this guy, right? And he used to introduce me last out to my brothers. So he used to say, that's my older son, Imad. He's an engineer with a big smile. And that's my youngest son, Rabia. And he's a lawyer with a big smile. And that's my son, Mohammed. He's studying in Italy, <laughs> right? It used to be that I swear to you, it's not a joke. I'll send this to my dad and he'll confirm to you that, <laughs> literally, right? Because I'm studying gemologist. Like it took him maybe by the time I finished my degree to find out what, what, what does that mean even? Because <laughs> like, right? well, if you were not a doctor or a lawyer, our children, we do not teach them to become even entrepreneur. And even when we want to teach them to become entrepreneur, we send them to a business school. And all what they teach them to become nice corporate executives. They don't teach them to become entrepreneur, right? So they teach them how to run bureaucracy better, not to be entrepreneur. And entrepreneurship and being bureaucratic are the opposite completely. So entrepreneur is not a job that people want their children to be. When it's a little bit crazy because the biggest lawyers, they're entrepreneur to own, to own a law firm. 
And the biggest doctors, not in Canada, they become someone that wants to build their own hospital, but they have to have some entrepreneurial spirit. So I lived in a country where I couldn't have a plan for two years or three years. So when I went to Italy, studied in Italy, I finished my degree in geology. And then I did my degree the last year in gemology, which is the study of diamond ruby. So I'm basically an expert of diamond that sells shawarma, chicken shawarma, just to be specific. So, That's amazing. Right? That's amazing. Yeah. And, and then when I went back to Lebanon to give it another shot, because, you know, my mom wanted me to marry a Lebanese girl and stay beside her and, you know, the whole dreams of our mothers. And I went back and I thought everything is going to be great. Started my jewelry business. And six months in, the war restarted again. Oh, wow. Right? And this is when I start thinking it's Italy or somewhere else. Yeah. And yeah. that's it. So, so I got to ask this, and Omar, maybe you can dive in. Like, why gems? Like, why gemology? That's, that's the question I have, too. <laughs> How did that so happen? So, it's either, it's either two things. It's either I was finding that gemology as an excuse just to fly away and not to live with my parents because I needed a change. <laughs> which is a lot of us we do that we jump into something no i was i'm just kidding i was always amazed by the way that you can find something that ugly and people will buy it for that much money so i always wanted to understand what is it the science behind it and i always liked the idea of a pressure makes diamonds yeah. and then now i use it in business as a as actual part of my speech and part of my quotes that you know yes the coronavirus, guess what? This is going to make diamond because yes, maybe we're going to come out less people. Unfortunately, we lost over 4,000 Canadian and a lot of humans around the world. But how can we make it better? How can we make ourselves better, right? So pressure do make, make diamond and I can prove it scientifically. I'm a certified gemologist that can actually sign certificate of diamonds at the biggest level, at the biggest possible level. But I was always amazed with that business. And let me tell you something. When I want to retire, probably I'm going to buy a small diamond shop. And I'm going to sit in it and clean the window all day and enjoy it and talk to people. Because I love talking to people. I'm not a CEO to sit in the office. You know, Dr. Fakir, Dr. Fakir like, it, it makes me think of myself. Like, when I went to school, my mom and my dad wanted me to be a doctor and a lawyer engineer. And I did an economics degree. And they were already embarrassed with me for that. But I can't imagine what they would have said if I came to them and said, I want to study gem. <laughs> I think they would have been like just laughing out of the room. So I can understand completely what you're, what you're saying. And, you know, honestly, I, I think it's amazing. The fact that you, the, the fact that it's just the study of gemology is just so interesting to me. Uh, so interesting to me that somebody picks it. And also just like after you study it, how much you actually learn and actually go, when you actually go through it. Yes. And, and in the end of the day, what I can tell you here, uh, you need to study to study something because that will teach you how to organize yourself, structure yourself, structure a business. The end of product knowledge usually is not done by the CEO. And the CEO that's trying to do everything will do nothing. And if you do not want to grow your company, you do everything in it. If you do not want to grow your business, you do not count on your team. So it's actually, you need to know the product 100% because you're going to get to know it by hiring the right people that knows the product. What you need, you need is a proper culture and pro proper vision and proper approach to something. And those are skills that you learn at school, but the wisdom coming from real experience. Mm. So Dr. Faki, when you came to Canada, you didn't come with diamonds in your pocket, even though you were, you know, you were certified to study them. You came with $1,200. Uh, you didn't come, you know, you, you came nothing. How did your drive, how did that desire to build a culture, what got you from there to, to the next step? So it's, again, a very funny story, and you can ask a lot of my team. It's, it's like they'll remember it day by day because a lot of them are people, like the gentleman that runs our commissary kitchen, the master kitchen, he's the person who picked me up. He's the person, who's the person who picked me up at the airport. Uh, really? The first day I landed oh. in Canada, right? Uh, there's another gentleman that runs one of our locations downtown. He's the first person he used to lend me his car when I used to want to go out on the weekend. So we used to rotate on a car and we used to tape the fenders of the car from Home Depot with red tape because they were, they were falling apart together. And he's still here with me, right? So all of them knew that my parents did well in Lebanon. 
But right before I left, when I left the jewelry store and I said to my parents, this is it, I'm walking away and I'm leaving. And a friend of mine lived in Canada. He used to tell me how Canadians are so welcoming, how Canadians will make you feel more like a citizen than an immigrant immediately, how the people are so nice, right? How we say sorry too often, right? So he used to tell me how great the people are. And, you know, I felt in Italy it wasn't like this because I was there during the Iraq war. Right, so it was a little bit more racism and more attack on Arab and on Muslims. So I thought maybe I want to see a change. Right, so I went to my dad and I said, "I'm leaving to Canada." He said, "Well, you already made a mess doing a gemology thing. What are you going now alone? I'm not gonna support this. You have a business here. You know, you're gonna leave. You're gonna leave with nothing, and I have nothing to do with it." With a wink to my mom, basically, he ran back fast. Right. And I went to him and I said, look, uh, I brought money with me from Italy because I worked in Italy and I put it in the jewelry store. He said, well, look, I'm, I'm your dad, but consider me, I have zero money. How are you going to leave everything and run? I said, you know what? Give it to my brother. He loves the jewelry business. Let him move on with it. What about the ticket and me settling there? He said, I don't know. And then he said, you know what? I'm not going to be mean. Your ticket is $1,200. I'm going to give you $500. So that's all what he gave me. And that's the actual story, right? So I had a thousand dollars in my pocket. I paid for the rest of the tickets, settled a couple of things, and I came here with twelve hundred dollars in my pocket. I moved into a basement apartment. A Spanish lady that she's still a great friend of mine. We agreed that I'll do a, I'll, I'll share a basement with these two other guys, one Lebanese, one Palestinian, right? And I pay rent by teaching her daughter French. Wow. Yeah, because there was no cash. Yeah. I had no money. So even my jacket didn't work in Canada. I had to buy a new jacket. It's Canadian winter jacket. <laughs> my Lebanese winter jacket was a fake winter jacket, apparently. <laughs> so there was no money whatsoever. Right? And so I did. And then I went, I started applying in jewelry stores. I was an executive in Italy for a diamond company. Then I left everything, went to Lebanon. I came back here. And they, everyone was telling me, you have no Canadian experience. You have no Canadian experience. I'm like, the diamond don't speak a language. Like, diamond is a diamond. What does that mean? <laughs> I'm not understanding. And that's why, even until today, I do whatever I can to make it easier, easier on newcomers. So they ha can have better experience than the one we did. Right? Because I'm committed because I suffered that. Right? And so I had to go work at a coffee shop. So I went and I applied for Tim Horton. For four days, I realized that they sell pork. So I couldn't. Then I went to a Lebanese guy in Danforth. He had a coffee time. And he, wouldn't, he couldn't give me any shift except the night shift. So I started at 10 p.m. and I finished at 5 a.m. That was great. Because then I went to a jewelry store in the Eden Center and I offered them to work for free. Oh, my God. And the guy looked at me and said, it's either you're, a, you're crazy or you're a thief. I said, I'm not a thief. <laughs> and I can't say I'm not crazy, but that's what I want. Hire me for free. You decline me twice because you thought I'm not worth anything because I don't have Canadian experience. So he accepted. He put me on commission. And six months in, Another jewelry store, I don't know if you remember La Suisse, a watch company oh, yeah. in downtown Toronto, right? Yeah. So they came and they gave me a paying job. Wow. Right? And I became a manager of one location after three months. And after nine months, I became a district manager until a lady walked in one day. And she offered me a job at her jewelry store because I was honest with her. She wanted a watch. Don't learn it from me. The lady was, her wrist was much bigger than the watch. So I told her, and I was honest, and please do not repeat it and tell a woman that her wrist is big, but I did. I told her the watch is small. I blamed the watch. <laughs> right? And I actually convinced her that she will get a watch, that it's better for her, but it's cheaper. So she appreciated the honesty. She came back, and she offered me to move in her company, and I asked for a sweat equity. So I said, I'll work for minimum wage, but I need a percentage in the company. Otherwise, I will continue being an employee all my life, and that's not what I She said no. She thought I was dreaming. I was, but so what was worth a try, right? 
So she came back and she said yes after three months. And then when she, we grew the company to five locations and when she wanted to leave the business for health reasons, she helped me to buy two locations, waited for her money. And that was the first time I owned something on my own in Canada, uh -huh. right? So that's, that's how the that's, whole thing that is sounds like That doesn't sound real. That yeah. sound, that's, that's unreal. And like the fact that this happened like recently, it, it sounds is. unreal. It is, it's actually not, not too long ago. Yeah, like it yeah. sounds like, you know, like what they say, like the American dream is, like that's exactly like, that, that's, yeah, no, but I guess the Canadian dream. It the Canadian dream because I hate the American dream. It's about <laughs> the self, the interest, uh, like, you know, the sign of the American dream is the white picket fence. And in our countries, all the Muslim countries, because we watch a lot of American movies, the American dream is the whole thing. I think I want to start promoting the Canadian dream more. And I think it's a big mistake that we don't speak too often about the Canadian dream. So let's talk about the Canadian dream. But before we do that, uh, you, 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 you come here, you've done like, it seems like you've moved heaven and earth to start these, to come into these new stores that were the, for the first time that were yours. What trend, what's the transition from there to go towards eventually the founding of Paramount? So sorry? Sorry, what, how do you go from there, your first, you know, new stores that you own, how do you go from there to Paramount? Well, not a lot of people know about a stage of my life where I owned the Swatch. You know all the Swatch kiosks in the mall? That yeah. was my idea. I brought it from Switzerland. So <laughs> when I, yeah, so when, so people, people found out about me as if me and Shawarma were born together in Canada, <laughs> right? Because before Shawarma, people didn't know who Mohammed Fiki is and they thought I just woke up one day and decided to open an empire of Shawarma and it worked. It doesn't work that way. I wish. I wish that was easy. <laughs> right so so from that one jewelry store i actually went to switzerland i saw this idea at the airport and i brought the idea of all the swatch kiosks you saw in the shopping center that was my idea and then one day they decided they wanted it back and they tried to push me aside for very little money i sued them we settled it and i made good money and that was the first big money i've seen in my life like my account was always minus <laughs> right and when it was minus very like minus five thousand, it was great news for me, <laughs> right? So oh, listen, that's the truth, right? So from there, I even got to start building multi-million dollar homes by mistake. A friend of mine came from Lebanon, started to build a house, ran out of money, asked me to lend him some money. As soon as I settled my lawsuit, I lended him some money, started building homes. The first house I finished leaked on the people's head. And from there, I started building homes. I built maybe 20 homes in Mississauga, but we did very well. And we got some media coverage on one of the houses. And this is where my wife called me and said she wanted a kilo baklava because there was a couple coming to visit us. And she told me about this place behind the police station in Dixie and England thing called Paramount. And I was driving and you know, us uh, husbands, we mumble, why is it far? Why do I have to come all the way here? Like there is every place that sells baklava, <laughs> why this place? And I got there and uh, and I walk in at the place called Paramount, nothing Paramount about it. I mean, the doors were orange and the handles were broken and like completely mess. I walk in and I say, can I get a kilo baklava? And the guy said, yes. Oh, you're the guy that was on the news, uh, but you built a nice house, would you lend me $250,000? And I'm like, listen. <laughs> <laughs> I just want a kilo baklava. This day is not going well already. She's sending me to behind the police station and jail here and auto track drivers because to buy some dessert and now this guy wants 250000 You know one of those things, honestly, and it was, I'll never forget that moment. You know one of those things that, subhanAllah, they're thrown at you. You're almost running away from dealing with it. But it's meant to be. And it's meant to be in a certain way that I handed him the card and you know, one of those that you hand someone the card and you're hoping that he loses it or, or he'll never call you or something because you don't want to deal with the problem. But then I got into the card and I'm like, wasn't that me? Wasn't that me, the guy that needed help? That woman, the Italian woman that gave me an opportunity to own a sweat equity in her business. That was me and I needed help and Canadian help me. And I always say to all the young people or the people who's starting and I, we always attach the people starting and young 
I always believe that people can start again like Hazel McCallion. After stopping being a mayor, she started again and she was 75 already. Mm. But she has four jobs now. So you can start all the time, especially in our community. My dad keep telling me, when I die one day when he was 35, and when he was 40, he said, when I die one day, this is what you guys going to do. But dad, you're very young. And now, mashallah, he's almost 80. And he said, when I die one day, I said, dad, you've been telling me when you know when I die one day, 40 years. You know? So in our community, we need to realize that we could start all the time. We could start even mm. when we think. And what we used to call a starting late is not late. Hazel is 99. She has four jobs. I look up to that woman. She's my mentor. And I love, I love everything, like her, how resilient she is. Right? And it makes me feel lazy. She makes me feel like I've done nothing in my life. Like I'm less than 50 and she's 99. Like she's 50 years old, more than me at least, right? So I have another life on my hand that I can do much more. And that's hopefully that what we all believe. So we can multiply our effort, our impact, and our influence, right? Yeah, I, I completely agree with that. I think there's a, in our culture, there's a, a stigmatism, stigmatism when you get above 40 or 50 that you're like, I don't have that much, much time left. I I, yeah, I don't need to learn anything new. And, I think it even happens when you're younger. You want to do everything in your 20s. As soon as you hit your 30s, you're like, I need to be successful now. Right? Yeah. But the, 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 the time period of success is, is so much longer. Like, look at Hazel McCallum, right? like you said, 99. Like, look at people that are successful after they're 40 and 50 and 60. Like, they have so much yeah, more time the, to live. The right? founder of KFC, he was yes. a mess until 50. And then after mm. that, he started this recipe and it worked out after 50 years old. Right? So I sat down in the car and I always say to everyone, you have to decide who you want to be. Because the opportunities of making a difference comes as a surprise, as a coincidence. You won't have the time to say, mm, let me decide who I want to be now. And let me decide if I want to be a stand-up guy or a girl or not. So I always say, you need to decide who you want to be way ahead of time. Are you going to be a stand-up person or are you going to be a person just see things, keep their head down, and don't make a real difference in life. And that's, I think, the biggest decision that someone needs to make. You need to make a difference or not. Real difference. Difference that changes people's lives. And you could act like you are, but it doesn't work. You need to decide which whichever. It's only A or B. There is no C. If yes, you're going to go all the way. It hurts. And has to hurt. So I was in the car and I'm like, I think that's my test to see if I'm ready to be who I am, who I want to be. And I'm going to return everything that this country has given me, the people of this country has given me or not. And I'm going to turn my back to this family or not. And on my way out, he said one thing that hit me the hardest. He said, if you do not help me by Thursday, 15 chefs and their family, they will be deported from Canada. So I called him back right from the parking lot and I said, come see me at the office. And that's how I bought Paramount. Wow. Wow. Well, it must have been so yeah. tough for you like buying Paramount. Like, I know in the, in, the, in the early 2000s, there's shawarma restaurants almost on every corner. Right? Like, what, did, what did you do to differentiate yourself from every other shawarma establishment that's in, in the area? Yeah. And I'll just add, you come into a place that has broken handles, orange, nothing like the Paramount that we see today. What's your vision? How do you take it from there to where it is? Like, how do you grow it so fast? Like, I think it's probably hard to, I mean, coming, you know, uh, you know, having worked a little bit in corporate law beforehand, it's hard to actually think of a business that has exploded so fast. Um, uh, and like, you know, from an outsider perspective, seemingly without bumps, um, like Paramount. So, so, so how, what's your vision when you come in to this new establishment? I use the, all the tricks of everything. And it's all, always about the culture in business. And one more thing. When I came back to buy the company, because he called me and said he can't do it, even with my money, I realized one thing. I came back and I realized that the only way I can make this work, if I get the buy-in of the team, the buy-in of those chefs. I don't know how to fry an egg. My wife even says it's boring to eat with me. I eat so fast and I stand up and I leave. Like, right? She said, God, our kids are a little bit older because they sit and enjoy a table because you're like fast like someone's racing. 
uh, you, that's how I eat. So I'm boring to eat, but I don't know how to fry an egg and I own restaurants. That's crazy, <laughs> right? Even I say it myself, forget, I'm not waiting for someone to tell me that, right? But the bottom line is having someone is buy-in, everyone is buy-in. We all knew we could fail, but that's the IKEA syndrome. The IKEA syndrome is a study by Harvard University. So you, there is a company that's not a great furniture, sell it to you at a cheaper price, and they make you build it yourself. And they have the lowest amount of complaint in the world. Why? Mm. It's very simple. Because they make you build it, so you buy in, and now become your art piece, and you'll defend it. And if it breaks early, you blame your children, but not the table, because you installed it yourself. So they made you buy in, in building the table, and now it became your table, the one that you built, and therefore you're gonna make it successful. You're gonna make it great, and you're gonna advertise it, and you're gonna defend it. And that's the best way to follow in business, having people buy in. Let me tell you, one word today, one word, people, is the reason for success. The old bottom line in business used to be profit. You ask my dad, what's the most important about business? How much you make? The world today is a struggling about the theory I brought in 12 years ago. I didn't bring it in like I invented it, but I put it into execution at Paramount at least. And everybody used to think, how does that work? Why does he do it? Does he like to be out there on social media? Does he want to show off? Is that why he does it? No. The new theory that driving all businesses now crazy and shareholders are expecting from their CEO to do more of is people, purpose, planet for the profit to follow. And if a company culture does not look after people, and does not look after planet, and does not look after purpose, profit will not follow today. Let me break it down for you for a second. Number one, money is not a problem in the world of business today. There is a lot of money, a lot of investors, a lot of venture capital looking for ideas. Where does the ideas come from? People, talents. What does attract the new talents? If I pay someone $100,000 and five other companies pay them $100,000, why they want to be at PMO? Okay. Because they want to be part of something bigger than ourselves. Yeah. Right? So for yeah. you to make money, you need talents to bring you good ideas and great execution. For you to attract those talents that you need and you cannot live without, you need to have them to be part of something bigger than ourselves. At PMO, people will not leave our company because their children are involved in charitable work. They feel they make a bigger difference than just doing their job. They feel like they are part of a movement, not part of a business. Wow. And that's why I do not worry that someone recruit my employees. And guess what? If they are not happy and they're not performing their best, I go and I let them go. And everyone's surprised how I do firing in my company with a big smile in my face. My, the big mm -hmm. smile on my face because I'm giving them a better opportunity to find a place where they can fit better, mm -hmm. right? So people, if you have a company that worry and have all what they do like Paramount, our part of our DNA is giving back to the community. Our marketing campaign is giving back to the community. We live every day giving back to the community. We never get involved in a business if you tell me today there is 5,000 cell phones that you're going to make a $20 on and you're going to waste two weeks to do the deal and you're going to make a million dollars at the end and it doesn't do anything to me in my heart, it doesn't satisfy the other side, I don't need it. I don't need it. It has to do something bigger than the money. Mm. Because we all make money because we want to be happy. So why don't we make money while we're happy? Wow. 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 <laughs> Wow. Right? So that's purpose. So when we did World Hunger Day here, and I heard the second day that Carolyn White, born Canadian, daughter put a lemonade stand, and she said halal lemonade, and she's born Canadian, 
because she thought that because she wants to do it because of Paramount, she has to put halal on it. And she opened lemonade stand in her school. And Carolyn came back almost in tears saying, I thank you. You brought some charitable idea to my daughter's school, to our family table. I can bet you Carolyn gets an offer every day for double the money, but she will not go. Because we all do what we do because we want our children to look up to us and our parents to be proud of us. And if I can get with our work at Paramount and our work with the community and what we do every day to people's dining table that works at Paramount, that works side by side with me, the people that they are smarter than me at Paramount, right? And can get to their family and make their family better than ever leave the company. That's two, purpose. When you support a community, the community will support you back. The community would eat more at your place when they see you, that you don't use their money just to buy a better boat or nicer suit. Mm -hmm. You give it back to the community and everybody would want to support you and we all win and it become a circle. I make money, I give it back to the community, the community gets the money, they see that, they make money, they support me back and it goes into circle, mm -hmm. right? So it's not only the nice thing to do, it's not only the better thing for you to do. It's not only the Islamic thing to do. It's actually the profitable thing to do as well. So for the people that still think a wink, let me use a charity and act like I am being a charitable and maybe I'll make more money on the other side. No, no, no. Go ahead and do charity. And I promise you, it is actually something that will benefit you. I promise you. I can prove it by PNL, By profit and loss statement, it is the right thing. And definitely no younger people, no customer wants to support you if your company does not support the plan. And that makes it a profitable thing to do. So it will hit bottom line with profit. You know, all those books that I read about, about CSR and corporate social responsibility, I think what you just spoke about right now is better than all of, the, all of that right now. <laughs> yeah. just, just being frank. Like, but it's, it's great legitimate. because 10 years ago used to be lift service. Yeah. Now it's 50-50. Right? Mm. Some CEO, they cut a check. Other, they talk about it, but they don't do it. But we're much better. So we're moving forward. Right? And yeah. soon it's going to be CEOs are looked at by their staff and say, what do we really do? Right? And they'll compare it. We become, as a community, and please listen to me well about this point, because it's a message to all our community and to every other community. In politics, life, even within our religion, we become what we celebrate. If we celebrate philanthropy, people will maybe get jealous or look up to people who does philanthropy. A lot of people call me and say, I want to be part of this. And I love it. And some people say, I want to be too, alone. But I want to do like him. It doesn't matter what it is. But we become what we celebrate. If we celebrate business success, our children will grow wanting to become that. If we celebrate philanthropy, if we celebrate our name, Mohammed, not Mo, and Bilal, not Bill, we become more proud and we become what we celebrate. So we need to celebrate more what we want to become in the future. Wow. Right? And that's very important. And that's, that's what everybody's doing now. They want to become what we celebrated. So as was celebrated philanthropy, now people are doing it. And now they're realizing lip service is not working, they're doing it more. So we just want to do that. So, you know so I have to ask, sorry, like I have, a th I have things that I want to, other things that we're going to talk about and we're going to get into, but I, I got to ask about this. Don't you ever like, when, whenever, I, whenever I see you, when I hear you talk, when, when, you, when you speak about what your, your journey, which sounds still a little fantastical, you know, how, were you never afraid? Like you, you seem to be a person with- I'm, af I'm afraid now from both. You asked me the wrong question. I'm afraid every minute. I'm afraid every second. We all are. But... No, no. We don't... all have. No, no. We're all like a duck in life. We look very pretty from top of the water and we're struggling under. Right? And everybody take a picture from the top, but there is some struggle under. You know how many times I was in the shower and thinking that this is my last day in business and I'm going to bankrupt? I had my worst five days almost of my life, the end of March, where I realized I have to let go my biggest asset in life my team. When I realized I'm going to be facing a camera and laying off a human that served under my management, 
it almost broke my culture because I almost belong to the people who did more lip service. Because you don't, when I say to my team, you're my family. You don't fire your son if you run out of money. You don't fire your son if economic change or your, your bottom line change. So how am I gonna, how I'm gonna fire people I called my family over the last 12 years? How am I gonna lay them off? And then if I don't lay them off, how am I doing the right thing knowing what I know in numbers? Right? So they were five days. Then out of nowhere, I had a solution. And I found a solution where people that their old vacation to take a vacation, where we pay them, the cash flow will be hit, but not the profit loss statement. But at least they're using some of their vacation and they rotate so no one of them will run ever out of money. Right? Right. And then when People start calling saying, we do not want to work. We went and got a permit to sub their layoff. So they got a layoff 55% and we sub top, top 35% on mm. top. So they were getting 90% salary when they're sitting home. But Paramount was getting only 35. Right? So again, showing up for people. Half of life is showing up. You show up in funeral. You show up in weddings. You show up on matters. Life work balance doesn't exist. It doesn't exist. It's either you want to be someone, an employee that does 40 hours a week, or you want to be an entrepreneur and someone that wants to change the world. And it doesn't work one. You can't be every time beside your children. You can't be every time beside your community. The most important to be when it matters. Right? So you show up for your staff. Those five days of March during the coronavirus, as a CEO, it was a big test to my culture. It did shake me because everyone on my team, they were suggesting me, like a lot of things I've done in my life. People told me not to touch the Quebec City mosque. People told me not to touch the Iranian flight, right? But you know what? No, no, because it's not fun. Because it's not fun when I follow everyone what they want. What's right, what's the happiness means when you follow where you belong, what you're used to. Never lose who you are, and that's the most important. And if I didn't suggest even help to the Quebec mosque, I would have lost who I am. If I didn't stand up for Kevin Johnson, I would have lost who I was. And the biggest loss to all of us, that's why I always talk about Mo and Mohammed, Bill and Bilal, the biggest loss to any human when you lose who you are. Because when you have, and you are who you are, and proud of who you are, proud where we came from, proud of Rasul alayhi salatu wasalam, proud of what the Quran says, we can change the world. But never lose yourself. Never lose yourself to fit in. The world will fit in with you. We live in a country where people celebrated with the weirdest name. We have a chief in Mississauga of police. I can't freaking pronounce my name until today. But he's an amazing person. Right? So people will fit in. And that's the most important. You know, anyone that's we'll get uh, used to you. You know, anyone starting a business right now or has a business or even in business school and somebody that's been in corporate for a long time, I think they could all uh, just uh, listen to the last 20 minutes and they think they'll get their entire degree right there because I'm ready to run through a wall <laughs> or something right now. You know? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Why don't we charge for it and donate it? Yeah, I think we have to because I'm ready to run through a wall, man, right now. <laughs> okay. So speaking of running through walls and being true to who you are. Let's talk about the defamation lawsuit against Kevin Johnson. Obviously, it wouldn't be an NCCM podcast if we didn't talk about uh, civil liberties and legal challenges and Islamophobia and related things. Uh, so let's talk about the defamation lawsuit, which was the largest defamation award in Canadian history. Dr. Ricky, what led you to taking on this incredible battle? Uh, and maybe tell us a little bit about what happened. Well, I mean, exactly what happened is what led me. So it's very simple. What happened is what led me to do it. For me, people think, oh my God, it's very strategic. He has a lot of people, consultant, advisor. It's simple. It's simple. We actually go to paralysis by analysis. An immigrant comes to this country and they never want to rock the boat. Mm. We're almost very happy to what we've been given. As if someone's given, given it to us for charity. And we're worried to rock the boat and ask for more. 
it's almost that we have always one leg here, one leg there. And that we're half Canadian. If you treat yourself half Canadian, why are you expecting everybody else not to treat you that way? <laughs> so remember, the rights in Canada, the rules in Canada, the laws in Canada are available to you like they're available to the person that were born here. So it's either you're a Canadian by birth or by choice. The, the same rules apply. And if we're not convinced that way, that's 90% of the reason why we're silenced, why we do not stand up against hate, and why we do not always ask for our right, and why we have to ask 50 people before we say, should I actually go after this one? Yeah. When I go ask Mario, my friend, and I'll say, look, someone did that, I say, oh, go to, to, go to the police. If I was me, I would go to police in five minutes, and he'll give you the solution in five minutes. And for us, it's like measuring 50 times and cutting once, and by the time you finish measuring, the whole cutting is gone, the opportunity, and you probably lost your legal rights before you do it. It's very simple. A man showed up when the Prime Minister Trudeau came to Panama and stood outside and said, the owner of this restaurant is a terrorist, and you will be only allowed to this restaurant if you have raped your wife or someone else's wife a few times. That's what Muslims do. Simple. Right? And now for me, it's a playbook, because you're going to see me following the same steps very soon again. I'm going to do it again soon, right? I'm going to say what time soon, but very soon, right? So the playbook is you send him a libel notice. But people like this, what they see, they see the libel notice and they take it and they say, that's a great opportunity for another, another video so I can punch him more. So they'll go with the libel notice to go on a video and call me more terrorist. That's what he did, Kevin Johnson. And he put my face full of blood with my hands full of blood. And my son actually saw it through a friend. Came and dad said, dad, what, the, what is this? Remember when I said to you, we do what we do in life to make our children proud and look up to us? So now my son is coming to question why his dad is being called terrorist. And I kill the children, Christian children, like all Muslims do. That's what he said in the video. Mm. This is when I realized that this is, the right thing to do is to offer the guy to apologize. And if he doesn't, right? Mm. I'm Lebanese, I've seen it all. <laughs> like, you know, I'm not gonna let the guy run me over and have an opportunity where I can defend my children and the definition to my children to me, and I always have this argument with my lovely wife that she's amazing and so patient and she's, she's honestly the biggest support. And my children are not my three boys. My children are my community children, our community children. And they need to show a lot, of, to be shown a lot of lead and let be a fair example. Because they feel to fit in, they need to be cool, they need to be more Canadian, that is attached to be a little bit less Muslimish, And I don't mm. agree with that. And they need to see a lot of great Muslim examples, successful Muslim examples, uh, stand up Muslim examples, right? And so I thought, no, I'm not gonna let it go. My wife said in the beginning, you know, this is a lone wolf. A lot of people said, let it go. He's a crazy, he's a psycho. Sure, that doesn't give him the okay to do that. So I actually sent him a letter to apologize. He took it, made a video, made fun of me, called me terrorist again, made a big video about me. It was entertaining, the video. I watched it three times, you know, and uh, <laughs> we decided to take him on. And we took him on. It was, it was fine until he followed me in a shopping center and stick the phone five inches away from my son, five years old. And, and Boyer was texting me, do not punch him. You're going to say tomorrow, a Muslim punched a white man. Maybe that's mm. the only time in my life ever I wanted to be a white man for five seconds. Otherwise, I'm very proud. I just wanted to punch him because I felt like someone is slicing my skin with a knife in front of my children, taking my pride away, taking everything I taught them to stand up to bullies, and I wasn't allowed to do anything. I wasn't allowed not because I'm afraid. I wasn't allowed because the victory was a bigger picture and a bigger win for all of us over me winning for five minutes in front of my boys. And I had to swallow it. Let me tell you, you want to talk about conviction and admit, admitting things? I had to tell my wife that I had a trip to Ottawa the same night. 
that this happened. And I went to a hotel and I got sick alone for three days because it hurt me so much that I couldn't stand up for my children, right? And this is where I decided that if it was for the last day of my life, I'm gonna win against this man and I'm gonna change his life. And that's what happened. And the court came, we won two and a half million dollars, alhamdulillah, the biggest lawsuit, the biggest uh, reward on the defamation claim. And I will be doing it again in probably a month with somebody else, right? With a smile on my face because we have the playbook now and we know exactly what's happening. So, you know, but it's all in the right time. It's all with understanding the bigger picture and it's all for this community to be more proud, more uh, proud of who we are and understanding our rights and not to be a silent witness to hate. Because the people who are against hate are much bigger in number. But we cannot be silent about it. Because our silence is a wink. We're sending a message that we're okay with it. We're sending a message that we're okay with Keep doing what you're doing. We're not going to do anything about it. And we can't do that. Mm. And, and I mean, I, I don't even have words to describe. Like, you know, I, I, we do this at NCCM every day. And if folks ever do go through instances of Islamophobia uh, or hate or folks come after you or, you know, if you're, for that matter, if you're any Canadian and somebody comes after you unfairly, call NCCM and we'll, we'll always be there in your corner. But it still raises the, like it literally raises the hair on my arms to hear you talk about that story. Uh, like may, may God reward you and, 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 and keep you firm in doing the work that you're doing. Uh, just unreal. Well, I mean, alhamdulillah, I think I was tested. I think there is azure in it. And if there is no, at least, if there was no azure in it, alhamdulillah, because there is a precedence that I heard a lot of people are using in court. Yeah. I'll be personally using in court very soon again, right? But you know what? Alhamdulillah. You do what you do for the right intention. And it doesn't matter what will end up. And alhamdulillah, we set an example that our kids could lean on for the rest of our lives. Yeah, I'm, With I'm this sitting, one particular. I'm sitting here listening to the story. And like, I, I'm just like, I know the story, right? And I'm still tearing up just imagining you at the mall with your, your son. I'm gonna, it's going to be like, the whole, the whole it, it goes along with the whole like story that you like of your life it's like who's gonna play you in the movie you know because it, it, it honestly feels like that <laughs> it yeah. feels like Look, the nccm sent you guys sent fatima to court that's right <laughs> there was yeah. there was like 20 30 thugs there to bully me and and she was listening to only the first 20 minutes i turned on my right and fatima was crying and she said i don't know you i don't, I don't believe that you went through this alone right but subhanallah, like, like you see me, I talk about it. I work 21 hours, nothing, nothing hurt except my job. Again, when you do what you love doing, and when you do every day, what, what, when you do every day what fills up your heart with happiness, that's exactly what makes you be able to stand up every day, get up every morning, and excited more than the day before. And all what I'm saying to everyone, please don't be afraid to rock the boat. Rock it. Be proud to rock the boat. We have an amazing community today. We have a lot of experts. We have people in NCCM, mashallah, all of you guys, that people can call you and ask you, don't let your right go. Don't put your head down. We, we are mandated by Rasul alayhi salatu wasalam that we stand up proud as Muslims, that we will be proud with Islam. Yes, maybe, maybe you see me with a gel in my hair and everything. And, but it's not about that. It's about your heart, how much you believe in that and what the Quran is saying to us and how you represent us out there. Not by look, by fact, by real things that makes real differences. And please don't let, don't let anyone tell you differently. Don't let anyone tell you that it's okay, let it go. No, don't. And it doesn't make you troublemaker. You're just studying your options. Because when you do nothing, you're inviting others to do it to your friends and to your sister and to your brothers and to your cousins. So you were chosen to stop it right there and take that, take, take the advantage of that. And you have people to help you now. So just do it. Yeah.
still uh, we're still yeah. <laughs> we're still engaging. And even though amazingly, Dr. Fricky, we do this every day, but yeah. just hearing you talk about it is just uh, it's always a moment to just think about. It. And it was unexpected for me. I thought I was set in Canada and I'm doing well, and I've done a lot of philanthropy. But that's a beautiful message. Yeah. That hate can hit anyone. It doesn't matter how comfortable you thought you are, how respected you are to the community. I was hated when I thought I was set. I felt like I was back to the war in Lebanon, where I'm one, one facing another human that decided to try to humiliate me in front of my children. So that, that you know, Mike Tyson said something, said everyone has a plan until they, they got punched in the face. In the face. <laughs> right? yeah. So I got punched in the face. I got punched in the face. I realized that I'm back to exactly when I arrived here with a $1,200 in my pocket with this man. And the only thing left is for me is my pride and I'm going to stand up for what I stand up for, for who I am. And I am that Muslim, a proud Canadian boy that was wired with a sadaqa box and was wired that you need to be proud of being Muslim and stand up for Islam. And I decided that I let it go. It doesn't matter. He threatened me to kill me. He threatened my children. He threatened me to put some women on me to say that I did this to them and I did this to them. And you know what? I said to my wife, if I let go, I'm gonna lose myself. I'm never gonna respect myself. So anything else beyond that for me, I can do. But don't ask me to do, and she never did. She was only upset with me when he attacked the kids in the mall, but she's right. Like I exposed the kids and she was upset for 10 minutes. And then she, she said, Astaghfirullah Azim, I'm sorry, but I was worried about the kids. I was worried about the kids too. Mm -hmm. But I would yeah. never, they would never be proud of me if I would have. Dr. Bakia, I think you mentioned like such a, Sorry? Uh, I think you mentioned such a great point where you said you were wired with that sadaqa box, right? Because, you know, many people see that you've gone through this defamation lawsuit, you've had that whole battle and, you know, you, you continuously are always giving back to the community still, right? Like no matter what they put you down and how much they've hit you down, like from the Mississauga Food Bank to the Feed the Heroes campaign, the... Quebec shoot, the Quebec City mosh attack, the Iran plane. The like Iranian mentioned. flight. Yeah, every Iranian. single thing, like continuously, like you're giving, giving, giving back, no matter how many times anyone comes and knocks you down. Like that passion that you have inside you to give back, is that something that was just drilled inside you, like from your from a young age, from your mom, or is that like continuously what feeds you every single day? Well, I think, uh, again, uh, everything in life like a muscle. The more you do it, stronger and better you become at it. And again, going back to we become what we celebrate. So when my mom used to celebrate, any one of us who put 50 cents instead of 25 cents, my other brother wanted to put 75 cents. So I started putting a dollar. And we were celebrated for what we're giving. Right? And growing up was more, how much you've given, how many good deeds you've done. Did you go to your grandma and help her? So we became what we were celebrated for when we were children. And Canada celebrated me for what I was giving when I was giving very little. And it reminded me that nostalgia feeling of what, when my mom used to celebrate me when I was giving. And I wanted never to stop it. And let me tell you what happened during coronavirus. A young entrepreneur that I mentored, I mentored a lot of people. And young entrepreneur that I was uh, uh, mentoring I start seeing them. One of them is a Sikh from, like, an Indian Sikh from uh, Mississauga, and another one is Palestinian uh, Christian. And they start and heroes and the hungry. And you don't know the celebration I had. Seeing that you mentored them to make money, but they got mentored automatically to make money and give back. Yeah. Like, you know, that's a mentor gratification. People say, why do you mentor a lot of companies? Why do you mentor a lot of people? My gratification is seeing them succeed and seeing them giving back, seeing them prosper and seeing them benefit the community at the same time, right? Life is not easy. But the people that think, you know, life is easy. I was called terrorist three days ago again by somebody. And I still felt the unfairness of what did I do? I have nothing to do with this. Why am I called terrorist? of course because they see someone that people see out there active too much too active 
and they feel that the only way that they are to match the imaginary level that they think it's important to them is to bring you down, not for them to work on themselves and rise and to go up. So they try to bring you down to how low they are. But I smile. You know, now we figured out the cage. We know that they all look the same, but there is a door and we know how to get them into the door and lock them in. And we're gonna do it again. We're gonna do it again for the sake of the Muslim community. Because we you need know, to teach people say, right? not to call one Muslim a terrorist ever again. I'm not trapped in here with you. You're trapped in here with me. So, <laughs> <laughs> so don't, uh, you know, you go up against Dr. Fricky and, you know, you, you get what's coming to you. And that goes for anybody in the Canadian Muslim community. Uh, if you come after uh, folks, and in fact, any Canadian, if you go after folks unjustly, there will always be people who will stand up and it's such a powerful example that, that you're setting forward, uh, you know, in terms of, you know, fr from shareholder activism to uh, CSR to everywhere in between. Dr. Fricky, you're, you're setting such an incredible example for, for, for businesses, for average Canadians. And I'm going to wrap up with this last question. And it's a question that, you know, a lot of business owners across Canada have been wondering about. It's not really fair to, this is an unfair question. But if you were going to give one suggestion for business owners right now who are struggling in the COVID-19 world, what would that suggestion be? I would things. One, find the mentors. Two, never take your great idea to the grave with you. Take your chances. Take your risk. The rule said, the alchemist said, you're going to fall and trip seven times before you stand up once. So be prepared to fail because every time you fail is one time less to get to success. Three, know what you don't know. You need to know in life what you don't know. And then you hire the best team that will, you will give them so much autonomy and you let them work. Don't hire people to let them do what you want them to do. Hire people that they will bring you the idea. So know what you don't know is very important. The worst thing in business and life when people don't know what they don't know. It's very important. Mm -hmm. And the last, surround yourself with a great community. Because without a good family, good team, and good community, there is no success. Give back to your community. A lot of people say, why does Mohammed go out publicly when he gives back? What you guys see is only possibly 20% of what we do. But I am never going to be able to raise $3.7 million for the plane alone. And I'm never going to be able to pay $840,000 or million one today we reached, sorry, million fifty we reached today with the Misaga Food Bank. So we take it to public. We get, we get punched in the face on Twitter. Why are you guys putting out how much you're donating? But they don't realize by the time we finish those tweets and replying to them, we were already at half million dollars. And then we tweeted again and we upset some people again. So they retweeted us and some people say, no, but he's right, let me donate. And then we got to the million the bottom line is helping the people and the needy. The bottom line is the bigger picture. The bigger picture is the bottom line. So find a mentor. Be prepared to fail. Don't take your ideas with you to the grave. Right? Know what you don't know in life. Surround yourself with a family, with a team that's like your family, with a community that loves you and respects you like their family, and give back to the community. I think these are, this is a straight recipe to success no matter what you do in life. And definitely, Baraka from Allah, because maybe you did everything wrong, but Allah wanted to test you. I don't think you could have ended any, any better than that, Dr. Faki. Like That was uh, a perfect bow on it. Um, that brings us to the end of the podcast today. Uh, Mustafa, do you have anything you want to say anything before we sign off today? No, no I just want to thank you so much. Mom, go ahead, go ahead. No, go, go for Dr. Fricky. No, you go ahead. No, no, I'll, it's fine. <laughs> I just wanted to say thank you so much. Like, uh, this has probably been one of the high, definitely been the highlight of my week thus far. Uh, maybe the highlight of my last month, just having this fun. Even though we, we talk all the time and we're always in conversation, just getting to hear you uh, talk about your vision, talk about your perspective, talk about the future, talk about the past. Uh, it was just an incredible honor for, for me. Uh, personally, so I, I want to say thank you. No, thank you very much for both of you. And I wanted to say, my mom always taught me when, when 
the ship that has something to do lillah will never sink so all what you do in life whatever you do small or big have something lillah because that will never sink thank you very much for everyone and please enjoy the adhan and the call to prayer in this ramadan because we couldn't enjoy the mosque and don't let anyone make you do anything else don't celebrate at the least on the least important thing don't let anyone take you away from that beautiful voice and celebration we're better than that we're bigger than that we're stronger than that because we learned that allah will, allah is always akbar so thank you very much for this and thank you so much ramadan kareem everybody. ramadan kareem thank you guys so much for your guys time um for anyone that hasn't followed uh, dr fakhi on on facebook or twitter or instagram be sure to go out there and follow him on all the social medias um and follow paramount fine foods as well uh they're on everything as well so you'll find out everything that he's doing um and you can check out all the great work he's doing with uh the misaga food bank uh with uh the food he's doing right now with the, the, they're giving out food at paramount fine foods for every, all the healthcare workers if you bring, bring your id you'll be able to get a discount on, on on food as well so if any of the healthcare workers are listening please be sure to um to, to look at the feed the heroes campaign that they're doing as well cuz the work that they are doing is absolutely fantastic uh so that brings us all today thank you guys so much thank you dr faki thank you mustafa for your guys time uh masalam and we'll see you guys next week take care you've been listening to profile at nccm podcast be sure to follow us on social media on facebook and twitter it's at @nccm and for instagram it's at @nccm_community Thank you for listening and be sure to check back next week.